Thank you, Tammy, and welcome, everybody, to our webinar today. So my name is Ted Wattel, and I am an attorney with Bradford & Barthel in our Tarzana office. And before I get started, I just want to uh, tell you a little bit uh, about myself. Uh, first of all, I was born and raised in Connecticut and uh, then went to college and law school in New York City and practiced uh, civil litigation in New York before moving to Los Angeles in 2003. When I moved here, I took and thankfully passed the California bar and ever since 2003 have been exclusively practicing workers' compensation law. My career started on the defense side. I worked for a small, what we would call boutique uh, defense firm representing a, a varied uh, a, a client base of, of self-insured uh, employers as well as insurance companies. And I will tell you, working for a small firm in Southern California, I went to every board from San Diego up to, let's say, Bakersfield. So I was just all over the place. At a certain point, um, I decided to, you'll excuse me, uh, switch to the other side, and that, that's what actually brings me to you today. Uh, and uh, for a few years, I worked uh, as an applicant's attorney. I worked at a firm in the Valley, San Fernando Valley, which I believe is one of the most respected and is certainly one of the most aggressive applicant's attorneys, law firms in not only Southern California, but in the state of California. And I must say that in working for that firm, I got some of the best experience I ever could have gotten in being a defense attorney. Uh, after uh, I decided it was uh, time to move on, uh, I joined Bradford and Barthel, and as I already said, that's where I am today. My purpose today is to provide you with an insider's view of an applicant's attorney's firm. So first of all, there will be times where I will be speaking to you as an applicant's attorney. Now, don't forget, I am your attorney, but there to make it the most effective, I at some times want to actually put on the applicant's attorney's hat uh, and speak from that viewpoint. So uh, don't be don't be misled or misunderstood uh, that I'm not on your side if, if if I take that approach. So to begin, um, uh, I apologize. I'm actually going to start with something that's not. Uh, even on the slides, but which I think is uh, very, very important. Um, and that is, as an applicant's attorney, and then, frankly, as a defense attorney as well, I always, and we always went by the motto, A, B, C. Always be closing. And as you know, unless applicant's attorneys are closing cases on a regular basis, they simply cannot survive. So every single time I went to the board, a deposition, or any kind of conference as an applicant's attorney, my intention always was to make money. And the best way to do that was to settle a case. Whatever the issue was, it was the, the primary goal was to see, can I settle this case today? And also that's why, especially if I was at the board, I would always want to have the applicant there, even if the hearing wasn't on an issue that would require the applicant being there, because in case we could settle, I wanted the applicant there to be able to sign the settlement documents. Now, I bring this up because uh, it, with you in your positions, when and I and um, I, I don't know if there are 
uh, if we have a combination of, of uh, examiners, uh, attorneys uh, listening, but uh, I guess in particular I'm uh, speaking to the um, to the clients now, the examiners. Um, it's it's always uh, uh, possible that the attorney that's appearing for you will be calling you about settling the case, and it's important that we have in mind what I said earlier, which is that if the applicant's attorneys are not constantly closing cases and generating fees, they cannot continue to survive. So we have uh, a, some leverage in that sense over the applicant's attorneys uh, it, knowing that they need to be able to close cases on a regular basis. The other insight, though, with respect to that that I want to give you is this. It is, for a number of reasons, very difficult to be an applicant's attorney in today's environment. And I want to focus on one thing in particular. Applicants, for the most part, are very difficult clients. And I would say the biggest reason that I found as an applicant's attorney that they were difficult is called the internet. It used to be that they would go to the board and talk to people in the waiting room, and that's how they would get their information. This one settled for this amount, and this one is looking for this amount. Well, today, my experience is, or was, that the applicant's go on the internet and they do a little bit of research and we know the old motto, the danger of a little bit of knowledge. And what and they think just by going on the internet and doing a little bit of research that they now know everything they need to know about their case. And it makes it in some cases very difficult to have client control. So when your attorney when you're discussing, uh, when the attorney is uh, at the board, your attorney is at the board, and discussing settlement with the applicant's attorney, and may come back to you um, and and say something to the effect of that the applicant's attorney is is uh, having some difficulty. We, you know, in order to close this case, we may need a little more money. A lot of the times, especially when it's an applicant's attorney that uh, that we as the defense attorneys, you know, know well and trust. Uh, it really may be the case that the applicant's attorney is having client control because the client thinks that they know what is right. So that's the first thing that I wanted to give you by way of an introduction and that we should all keep in mind. Now, turning to the actual litigation of the case, the most important part of the case for the applicant's attorney is from that initial phone call by the applicant. At the firm that I worked at, we did not have paralegals or secretaries even take an initial call. If a prospective client called in, it would be referred to an attorney. So if I got a call and it was referred to me, I would speak to the applicant and just, you know, get a general idea of what their case was about. Make sure they're not in Texas or New Hampshire or something, first of all, uh, uh, and uh, that their their job, at least, and, and where they were allegedly injured uh, was in the state of California. Once I evaluated whether uh, the case was a viable case, uh, then I made an appointment with them to come in for the intake. Again, the intake I did with the applicant. And the most important part of that intake was filling out the application. So the applicant would come in, and the applicant might have a, or would have, let's say, a particular complaint. I fell, my back hurts, or I, my, my knees have started to hurt. But, and, and of course, I would take all of that into consideration. But what I would do with the applicant is, don't get too angry about this, but this is the, this is the reality. I would go, I would say to the applicant, thank you for that information. 
Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to start from the top of your head and work your way down to the tips of your toes. And I want you to tell me every single problem that you are having. And don't think about whether it's work-related, whether it's not work-related, whether you've had this condition for 30 years. I simply want to know every single physical complaint that you have. And we would go down and list every single complaint. And then after we did it on what I would refer to as an orthopedic basis, I would ask them about things like, well, are you having any headaches? Uh, are you having any problems with your stomach? Are you having any sexual problems? So move more into the uh, internal aspect of the, of the applicant. And of course, then ask them about their emotional state. Now, I will say that both for myself and I do believe the attorneys in the firm that I work for would not make things up. Don't laugh too hard. But I, I really uh, did not make things up. If I asked the applicant, and believe me, I would ask them, but if they told me, if I asked them if they were having a certain complaint and they said, no, I'm, re I'm not having that complaint, I would not put it down. But if they, if I asked them, are you having any problems with your stomach? And they said, yeah, you know, I, I, I do notice that, you know, when I eat certain foods, I am having some problem, then I would put it down. I didn't care what it was related to. I, if, if they said, yes, I'm having it, then I would put it down. And that was the very, very start of the process, listing every single possible problem. And the question is, why? Why would I want to do that? And the reason that I would want to do that is because ultimately what I want to do under the present system is to get as many rating strings as possible. I don't care whether a rating string ends up at 3%. I want to get as many rating strings as possible for as many physical complaints or medical conditions, the goal of which, of course, would be, if possible, to get to or above a life pension. And the more rating strings I had, the more likely it was that that would be the case. You, we all know the saying, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Well, in this particular case, the Lord tooketh, okay, from applicants, attorneys, it took away uh, the, the higher, well, in, in some cases, the higher PD levels, although under the current systems, in, in some instances, it actually could be a higher level of permanent disability, but took away the work restrictions and, and, and some of the things that would lead to higher PD, but what, as, what we got, or what applicants attorneys got in exchange was that things were no longer subsumed. We all know that under the 1997 permanent disability rating schedule, uh, if you had a certain work restriction, if you had other work restrictions, but they were subsumed in the larger restriction, then you didn't get anything for that. Well, under the current system, we know that that is, for the most part, not the case. Nothing is subsumed again, for the most part. So again, I want to get as many rating strings as possible. And I would want to get it to get the highest level of permanent disability I can. But I would also want to plead it, going back to the application, because, and as it indicates there on the, on the slide, uh, we all know that if psych is pled and, and certain other things are pled, we may end up doing, let's say, a stip for the orthopedic part, but we will do some kind of a CNR for uh, some of the other medical conditions uh, that are pled but are not admittedly as strong. So I knew that the more things that I put on that application, at the end of the day, the more money that I was going to get. Uh, the more money that I was going to get. But again, 
the initial thing was to get as many rating strings as possible. Now, I just turned to the next slide, and we're talking about um, treating doctors, and I want to take a little bit of a of, of a detour here, which is, is something that I've grappled with on my own and and with uh, uh, my clients, and um, it, it relates to this uh, issue of of treating doctors and. That is whether to accept or deny a case. Um, usually, with a, especially with a continuous trauma, for the most part, at least in my experience, we will deny uh, the case. Of course, it, but the 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 uh, excuse me the 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 problem with that that I find is that once, of course, we deny the case, we lose medical control. Now, of course, if we accept the case, then we are going to be potentially on the hook for temporary disability. Except for the aspect of temporary disability, uh, I don't really see, uh, and there may be some of you who disagree with me on this, um, a, uh, a big issue of accepting a case because, look, ultimately, the degree to which we are going to, whether we're going to be liable, and if so, what we're going to be liable for is going to be determined by doctors and, if necessary, ultimately a judge. And let's say we accept a case, let's say we even have to start paying temporary disability, if we can get the applicant in for PQME evaluations uh, as quickly as possible, then we can limit the liability. The problem with a denied case, and it's also the case, it's also true with an accepted case, is that it allows me as an applicant's attorney to do what I want to do. And what I want to do is I want to get as many treating doctors as possible in as many different specialties as possible. And I want to do that again because I want to increase the number of rating strings, and listen, once I get a treating doctor, then it's, I don't really, as an applicant's attorney, I'm not really the one that needs the PQME. You, the defendant, are the ones that need the PQME. Uh, and once I have a doctor who's uh, diagnosing an internal injury or a neurological injury, you're the one that's got to go out and get the PQME. So uh, by by having as many uh, conditions pled as possible, I can then get treating doctors and then have to get PQMEs. Uh, even if it's in, let's say, certain things are accepted, well, that's okay. So I'll treat within the MPN on the things that are accepted, but I'm still going to go out and get my... Uh, my, my treating doctors uh, uh, on, on a lean basis, although we all know it's becoming more and more difficult, but there are still doctors out there who will treat on a lean basis. So again, um, I want to get as many treating doctors as I can and as many specialties as I can, again, to get as many uh, uh, rating strings uh, as I can. And the next slide, which I just uh, switch to really uh, focuses on that uh, on that same issue. So this is really, as an applicant's attorney, this, this, this is really the most important thing. This, this sets up the case. This sets up the case. And also, if I get a treating doctor in a particular area, in a particular field, uh, if it's the uh, defendant that then goes and asks for the uh, PQME because they need it. They need it because it's a treating doctor. Uh, what I'm going to be looking for is when that request for a PQME is made. I'm not necessarily, as an applicant's attorney, going to sign that form 31.7. I'm going to look and see. Well, how long is the treating doctor? How long is the how long is the defendant has the treating doctor's report? If they've been uh, dilatory in getting, if the defense has been dilatory in getting a PQME, then I'm not going to sign that form and let them let the defendant file a DOR, let them try to get an order from the judge. I'm going to try to prevent the uh, defense from 
getting the PQME. And if I can do that and go to trial, well, the, the uh, of course, there's still an issue of substantial medical evidence, but then the judge only has one medical report in that particular area to go on. Okay. Uh, now, as far as the uh, medical provider network is concerned, uh, I never, as an applicant's attorney, had a problem with the medical provider networks. Uh, I, uh, I, except maybe in one case, I found the medical provider networks to have tons of doctors on there that I was quite, quite happy with. In fact, it was amazing to me, uh, some of the doctors, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure it is to you too, uh, the, the, some of the doctors that uh, were on the uh, were on the MPN, doctors who uh, yeah I felt were going to be uh, very favorable to me. So uh, I had uh, no problem with uh, uh, having um, MPN uh, doctors. Uh, and of course, where something wasn't accepted, then I would. Uh, go ahead and, and, and try to find a doctor um, on a lean basis. The main issue that I found with respect to the medical provider networks, and I know we experience this, or at least get complaints about it on the defense side, is doctors that are on the medical provider network that would not treat. And as an applicant's attorney, it was extremely frustrating. And speaking now as defense people, I don't know if there's anything that we can do about it. Because as far as I'm concerned, if a doctor is on the medical provider network, to me, they are representing that they are prepared to treat the applicant if authorization is given to them. And I cannot tell you the number of times that I would go on the MPN, send a 4600 letter, the designation of the MPN doctor, authorization was given by the claims examiner, and either the doctor would say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not taking new patients, or and I would get this more and more and more, I only treat, this is orthopedic, I only treat the upper extremities, or I only treat the lower extremities. Now, I understand that medicine has become much more specialized, but I don't recall seeing that when I first started practicing workers' compensation law. Uh, doctors uh, refusing uh, to treat because they limited themselves to parts of body. So I don't know if that's just a change in the medical profession in general over the years, or if that is something that is an MPN and a workers' compensation uh, issue. Uh, the other thing that I found to be incredibly uh, frustrating uh, is that often the MPN doctors, and this happened a number of times, wouldn't, even after getting authorization, would not agree to treat the applicant without first having an opportunity to review the entire medical record. So we would send the doctor the entire medical record. And the doctor, two weeks later, would come back and would say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not, I've decided not to take this case. And this has to do, uh, th this dovetails with the issue of difficulty in getting treatment. It brings me to a point that um, I, I want to make and actually wanted to make at the very beginning. Is my experience as an applicant's attorney is this. The vast majority of applicants that would come to me did so because they were not getting treatment. That was the reason they were coming through the door. I don't know if that's something you're already aware of or if it's something that you agree or disagree with, but I can tell you in my experience, the reason why 
the individual even sought out an attorney is because they were not getting medical treatment and felt they had no recourse other than to seek assistance from a lawyer. Uh, with respect, going back to the uh, difficulty in even getting the MPN doctors to treat, uh, what this allowed me to do is to file a DOR and go into court and say, listen, judge, I have contacted and even gotten authorization for three MPN treating doctors, and all three have refused to treat. To me, this represents a denial of care, and I request an order to treat outside of the medical provider network. And in some cases, I, the, the judge would order that. So I see this uh, uh, as a, a, a very big uh, problem for us uh, because it opens the door to the possibility uh, of the applicant being able to treat outside of the MPN. Now I want to interject something here on this, uh, which kind of differs with, with what I just said. I was just in court yesterday. Uh, it was yesterday morning at the Los Angeles board uh, before Judge uh, Aslanian. I believe her name is. Um, she's a, uh, a fairly new judge, and uh, it was not. It had nothing to do with the case that I was on, but I was overhearing a, uh, a conversation, and uh, and so I, and, and I apologize. I, I tried to do some research afterwards, but just didn't have enough time to to to, to get the, the the to do full research on it. Um, she was referring to a case, actually, that Judge Lee at the uh, LAWCAB had where um, Judge Lee ruled that there was no limit to the number of doctors that an applicant's attorney had to go through before finding a treating doctor. Uh, if they needed to go through 10 doctors before actually finding an MPN doctor that was willing to treat, that did not constitute a denial of care. Now, I recall the judge, I'm talking about Judge Aslanian, uh, referring to this being a situation where it was perhaps not the, the first doctor uh, that was a treating doctor, but a subsequent treating doctor. So again, I apologize, I don't have full information on this. And the regulation that was referred to was uh, 9767.5. Uh, and I uh, actually looked at the regulation. It's, it's a, got a lot of parts to it. And I didn't find anything jump out at me that was specifically on point. Um, so it's something that I will uh, look at further and um, we can get back to you on or, you know, as it comes up, um, you, sh uh, you will make you aware of it uh, either in general or, or on a case by case basis. Um, but it, it may be that what I said a moment ago, which is that if I can't find three doctors, I can go in and get an order from a judge to treat outside the MPN, um, may differ with some recent case law which has changed that. So I apologize, but I kind of have to leave that a little bit up in the air. But at least when I was a applicant's attorney, I was able to get orders to treat outside the MPN because of the difficulty in getting uh, MPN uh, treating doctors. And as far as I'm concerned, if, if this occurs, and certainly occurs you know, more than one occasion or a number of occasions with a particular doctor, then they should be told, uh, listen, when you're ready to treat on our MPN, let us know. We'll put you back on there. But if you're not going to accept uh, applicants, then don't, don't ask us to put you uh, on the uh, MPA. Okay, um, I'd like to uh, now move on to a very big topic, uh, of course, which is uh, utilization uh, review. With respect to utilization review, and I can't tell you the degree to which this is true, we had somebody uh, come into our office, again, this is when I was an applicant's attorney, uh, who had been on the defense side and told us some pretty disturbing information about utilization review. And again, 
I do not know if what she said is true. So I don't want to offend anybody by what I'm about to say. What she was saying is that the, the RFAs are being sent to people in faraway countries who are not medical professionals uh, and who are simply looking, they are scanning down the RFA and they are looking for certain key words to, or key phrases to determine that whether they are going to approve the request or not approve the request. For any of you who are listening who are attorneys, it's kind of the way that the bar is graded. Uh, we who sit for the bar, we have to write a total of eight essays, and what we find out is that the uh, examiners who are reviewing these are actually spending about a minute on each essay, and all they're doing is scanning the, the page to see are the key words in there. Well, that's what we were told is happening with the uh, RFAs uh, in utilization review. And of course, there's the other issue with IMR, uh, which I don't know, this may have changed, but at least when I was working for the applicant's firm, I was told that doctors are signing off on this who are, who are far retired and, and sitting on boats out, you know, parked outside of uh, uh, or in the harbor uh, in Santa Barbara. Now, I believe uh, within the last few years, there, would, there was a, uh, a, a case that came down uh, which actually put liability uh, on these doctors. So it, it, may, it may have, it, that, that part uh, may have changed. But what I want to bring you to is this in respect to being an applicant's attorney. As an applicant's attorney and as an applicant's attorney firm, we were training doctors what to put in their RFAs to increase the chance of it being approved by utilization review. So, for example, I remember in one situation, I had this doctor on a case of mine who wrote this beautiful narrative report and said to me, I've written the most amazing report. There's no way that my request for treatment is going to get denied. And, um, uh, and, Unfortunately, it, the, the request was denied uh, because the doctor didn't have the keywords in there. So what we learned as applicants' attorneys is it, what's, not, what's important is not for a doctor to write a glowing report, but for the key words to be in there. And we work to train the doctors, which is going to bring me to something else about what we have to do on the defense side. I was just told that Tammy has a question. I do. I do have a question. Okay. So if a PTP sends in an RFA for a condition that is not admitted without supporting documents and then retracts it within three business days, what is the carrier employer's oblig carrier slash employer's obligation to forward the RFA to UR? Okay. The answer to that specific question, I do not know. Uh, and I'm happy to look it up and provide whoever had the question with the um, answer. So I apologize on that. It does, so I, I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that specific question. Um, what I will say is this, which, which is something that is different but related. I recommend to my clients as, as a defense attorney the following. Even if a case is denied, I believe that all RFAs should be submitted to utilization review because a certification by utilization review does not equal approval of whatever treatment or diagnostic test was recommended. It can still be denied by the examiner because the case itself is denied. But if at some point, the case becomes accepted either voluntarily or by adjudication, and there have been RFAs submitted, and they have not been put through utilization review, then we on the defense side are now going to be liable for that treatment because the denial, which may have been just that the case is denied, is no longer valid, and we never put it through utilization review. 
So once again, I apologize at this moment, I can't answer that specific question, but it made me think of the other thing uh, about that I do believe, even on denied cases, that RFAs uh, should be put through utilization review. Uh, so maybe even uh, going back to the specific question, um, even though um, I don't know specifically legally off the top of my head, um, based upon what I just said, I would probably recommend that it still be put through uh, it, it still be put through UR, uh, because again, even if it's certified, we can still, we can still deny it. Uh, and if it happens to be a non-certification, we have that as a backup if the case becomes accepted. So I hope that helps you a little bit. And again, I apologize for, for not being able to answer that specific, um, question. Uh, now a moment ago, I talked about, uh, us training as applicants attorneys doctors on how to submit RFAs. And this brings me to this as defendants and as, as on the defense side. It is critical that we, I, I don't, I, I can't say use the word training doctors because it's not quite the, the same relationship, but it's very important that we as defense attorneys, examiners, clients, everyone, form legal valid relationships with doctors. For an example, here in the Bradford and Barthel Tarzana offices, and I'm sorry, I can't speak about the other offices, we have once a month a doctor who is used as a PQ at me in different specialties come in and speak to us. We learn and but I would say to a certain degree, even more so, the doctors get trained by coming to our office because they are enlightened about things that they didn't realize before. So number one, it trains them. And number two, if we have, if, if, if we, if they end up being a PQME on a case, if uh, we have to go in for to a cross X, you know, coming in and say, uh, hey, Ted Wachtell from Bradford and Barthel. Oh, that's right. I was just in your office, uh, uh, you know, a month ago or two months ago. You know, nice to see you again. Listen, I'm not saying it's going to be the dispositive uh, uh, factor in how the doctor uh, comes out on a particular issue, but it certainly is not going to hurt. And so it's extremely important that all of us on the defense side uh, be very, very active in, in, in spending time with doctors, training doctors. Uh, uh, I have a, a, a situation where we had a uh, doctor uh, come in fa fairly recently. He seems like a straight shooter, fairly young guy. And although for the most part we don't use AMEs because of an issue with the PQME and the time it's going to take to resolve the issue, we actually, um, you know, the examiner and I, we, we, we came to a, uh, and with the applicant's attorney, came to an agreement to actually use this doctor uh, as an agreed medical examiner. And the fact that he was just recently in our office uh, is, is definitely not going to hurt. Let's put it that way. So it's very important that not only the applicant's bar, which is very, very active, in forming relationships and training doctors. And I'm not even talking about the illegal stuff that goes on. Well, you know, allegedly illegal stuff that goes on. I'm just talking about, uh, you know, things that are not necessarily improper, but it, 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 it is a very big uh, uh, impact or a push on the applicant side to make sure that uh, doctors are constantly invited to applicants' attorneys' offices. Uh, and we need to be doing the same thing on the defense side. Uh, now, uh, the next slide, the Kite and Lord case. This particularly Kite is coming up much and much more. And I don't know if you are seeing it. Uh, I'll first just briefly touch upon, touch upon the Lord case, uh, which, um, a, uh, applicant's attorney, you know, while I've been here at Bradford and Barthel brought up, we ended up settling the case. So it didn't get litigated, but, there are multiple injuries with multiple defendants. And what the uh, applicant's attorney was arguing was that it was not 
multiple injuries, but rather it was the initial, there was the initial injury and that every injury after that was a compensable consequence of the original injury. This, I'm not talking about inextricably intertwined uh, under you know, the Benson case or, or a doctor concluding that uh, an injury is inextricably uh, intertwined. I'm talking about that the applicant's attorney arguing that the, the first injury, that was the real injury, and that's where the permanent disability should be, and everything else is a compensable consequence, and so it's really one injury. Uh, I saw that in one particular case, as I said, which we ended up settling, so uh, it was not adjudicated. The Kite case, I also have not had to bring to trial yet, but again, I am seeing this argued much, much more, and in certain circumstances, it is increasing the, uh, the amount of the settlement, because what the, under the, under the Kite case, the, let's say, PQME, with the proper justification, can conclude that the various, the various impairments, and remember I, at the beginning I talked about I want as many uh, rating strings as possible, should be added together, not combined under the combined values chart. And of course we all know that with the combined values chart, that serves to lessen uh, the PD, overall PD or impairment, relative to if we just added them together. Uh, the, the critical thing here is that there has to be no overlapping uh, body parts or uh, disability, and there has to be a synergistic effect. So uh, an, an example of what I'm talking about is let's say uh, an applicant has an injury to both hips. Now, if it was only one hip, then it could be argued that the applicant uh, is able to, to compensate to a certain degree with the non-injured hip. What would happen under the Kite case is, is that the argument would be that that is not possible and that the defendant should not have the benefit of the lowering of the impairment by the CVC method, but rather it should be added together. Again, I haven't had a case uh, that I've had to bring to trial on that issue, but I am seeing it, I don't know if you are, but I am seeing it more and more argued, and given that it is, at least theoretically, a legitimate argument, uh, I have had situations where uh, we have uh, ended up paying more in a settlement than we might have uh, done if that argument wasn't made and if there wasn't a basis for making the argument. And it also brings me back to aggressive applicants' attorneys. There are a lot of applicants' attorneys out there that are not as uh, knowledgeable, not as aggressive, uh, but it's the aggressive ones that are going to be arguing uh, under the Kite and the Lord case, and those are things that we have to uh, be looking out for, and obviously on a case-by-case -case basis would, would, would deal with that. I'd like to talk uh, briefly about psych. Of course, we know that any injury after January 1 of 2013, if the psych is a sequela to the orthopedic injury, there's not going to be any permanent disability. So, as an applicant's attorney, I would want to find any, if there were, if there was, if the applicant did tell me he's having emotional problems, whatever the nature of them might be, what I would do, and right at that intake, is I would try to find a way to make a claim of a psychiatric injury that was not an offshoot of the orthopedic injury. And uh, the example you've got under, you've got the, the, the example in the picture on the screen. I actually had an applicant come in and uh, it had to do uh, with, the injury had to do with a fall down the escalator. And so what he told me was that any time now that he goes into a department store or a store where he sees escalators, he, he, he starts to sweat and kind of get into a panic attack. So... Uh, what I did was I pled psych, and I but I, I didn't I didn't plead it as a sequela to the orthopedic injury. 
I, I separated it as uh, being related to this experience of whenever he sees an escalator, which I claim, you know, is just part of living. He has to do so on a, on a regular basis. And again, did not end up taking it to trial. Uh, so can't tell you what a judge would have done with it. But of course, increased the settlement uh, because number one, I had the site claimed there. I just had it there. So right away, that was going to increase the value of my settlement. And number two, I was able to make a valid, reasonably valid argument that this claim of psychiatric injury that I was making was separate and apart from the orthopedic injury. Even though this wasn't sudden and extraordinary, uh, it wasn't you know a, a bank robbery, wasn't a traumatic event, uh, I would always look for how could I separate a claim of psychiatric injury from uh, an orthopedic uh, injury? Fibromyalgia. Let me tell you, my friends, fibromyalgia happens to be one of my favorite topics, and I'll tell you why. I remember when I first started out uh, as a defense attorney, and uh, the firm that I worked for, we every winter we would go to either Palm Springs or San Diego to the California Applicants Attorneys Convention. And I remember Ken Rowan was still alive. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, know the name Ken Rowan. Um, we defense attorneys would be sitting in the back, and Ken Rowan would be up on the dais with a bunch of doctors, and he would be talking about, about fibro, fibromyalgia. Excuse me. And all the defense attorneys in the back would be laughing, oh, this is crazy, this is, you know, junk science, forget about it, it's never going to happen. Well, I don't know about you, but almost every other commercial for medication that I see on TV now has to do with either fibromyalgia or some kind of pain syndrome. So everybody who laughed at Ken Rowan back then uh, is uh, is eating crow now because fibromyalgia, we know, has not only become part and parcel of workers' compensation, it's become part and parcel of our society. Now, how do I get, as an applicant's attorney, how do I get impairment from fibromyalgia? How I get impairment is not through 3% for pain. How I get it is for a doctor to conclude that as a result of either the fibromyalgia, complex regional pain syndrome, some kind of pain syndrome, it is either caused or aggravated some other medical condition for which I can not only get impairment, but now I'm also going to be able to get treatment. For that condition and the two biggest are probably the biggest is high blood pressure and uh, another big one is aggravation of diabetes um, could be um, even even could be um, uh, in effect uh, uh, psychologically um, so um, and and the the really and I'm sure you've seen it the really good aggressive applicants attorneys are are pushing that are pushing this and if they're not then um, just speaking from a former applicant's attorney's point of view, they are, they're, they're missing out on, 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 on quite a, potentially quite a bit of money. And it's something that we have to look out for and be very, very careful, careful of. As soon as we see fibromyalgia, uh, some kind of a pain syndrome, not just kind of slough it off and say, okay, where's the applicant's attorney going with this? And by the way, this whole webinar really is, is designed for that, like is, is to bring these things to all of our attention so that when we see certain things, a red light goes on so that we try to kind of look, think to ourselves, okay, where's the applicant's attorney going with this? Where could this lead? Even if on its face, it doesn't seem like a big thing. Uh, MSAs. As an applicant's attorney, I loved MSAs because usually an MSA would increase the value of the case. So the, the defense wants an MSA, it's fine with me, uh, no problem whatsoever. Uh, and not only that, but I wanted it, I wanted it submitted to CMS. 
I wanted it submitted to CMS. Um, as a defense attorney now, with some of our clients, uh, we uh, have these non-submit uh, MSAs. Some of the applicant's attorneys that I deal with now uh, will push back on that and say, no, I I'm not, I'm not, you, you want to submit the case, that's fine. Uh, I, I want the MSA submitted to CMS uh, because uh, they're not concerned about it coming in lower. Um, they're hopeful that it's either going to stay the same or it's going to get higher. And in addition, they want protection uh, for their uh, client. They don't want uh, uh, CMS coming back to uh, either the applicant or the applicant's attorney uh, for having uh, not enough money put away for a future medical. So as an applicant's attorney, I loved uh, MSAs. You know, there's not, unfortunately, there's really not much we can uh, uh, do about it if it's required. Um, but uh, uh, applicants' attorneys are certainly not scared off uh, by MSAs. Uh, our last uh, topic for uh, today uh, is home health care. Uh, now, today, um, I would consider it to be not as significant to the extent that we do have utilization review, of course. We still, though, uh, it, I certainly do, uh, and you may as well have some of these older cases before utilization review came into effect where uh, a prescription would be written for home health care, or not even a prescription, a doctor, a treating doctor, AME, in those days it was probably a, 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 a defense PQ, uh, excuse me, a QME, um, even said, well, if it was a defense QME, <laughs> Uh, we should have gotten rid of them, but um, would would say something about home health care. And if we did not, as defendants, take some affirmative steps, then we were going to potentially be in big trouble. It's like the old days of vocational rehabilitation, uncapped, where the, as soon as the doctor said it, the clock started running or the or the the, the cash register uh, uh started kachinging uh because if we didn't do anything this this indication for home health care just kept running up and running up and running up and i have a, a couple of cases where unfortunately it, i mean the good side of it is that neither anybody involved in either the law firm or even on the client or on the client I was even around back then this is dating back to 2000 uh, but unfortunately, uh, nothing was done, and we're looking at uh, settling uh, home health care in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And under the Neri, N-E-R-I, Hernandez case, uh, in these situations where it was pre-UR, home health care was indicated, nothing was done, UR, even though it's in effect now, is not going to protect us from liability for home health care. Uh, the fact that there was uh, a failure to do something uh, really uh, at that point uh, took us out of the protection of UR even when it uh, came into, uh, even when it came into effect. So uh, we have to be very careful on that. And if you have any cases uh, where you see that, and you see that nothing's been done to, to bring it to whoever uh, is necessary's attention right away to make sure that that, that is addressed immediately because otherwise the, uh, the uh, as I said, the cash register uh, just uh, keeps, on, uh, keeps on going. So um, again, these are some of the things to look at uh, with aggressive applicants' attorneys. Uh, and um, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact me, our office. Uh, I thank you. It's been a pleasure. And uh, everyone have a great day.